Okay, good morning everyone. Mm-hmm. Welcome if you're joining us live on Facebook. And hopefully you've had a chance to listen to the song Oceans. If you're watching on Facebook, I do encourage you to listen to the song that's posted. Um, because we're going to be talking about that a lot this morning. You're going to think, well, hold on, this is a bit of a segue, Ruth. Hold on a minute, you're showing a picture of flooded Shrewsbury. Presumably most people can recognise this if you're not sure where it is. That is the bandstand of the quarry in the middle there. I believe I have a little pointer. Don't ask me how I eat. Oh, there we go. Yeah. And those who don't know, if you're not familiar, this should be the path through the quarry. I'm sure most of us have walked on numerous occasions. Um, and then obviously this is the town centre up here. What a week it has been for Shrewsbury. What a week it has been for a lot more than just Shrewsbury. Uh, but I want to be very clear, this is, I'm talking going to talk very specifically about what's happened in Shrewsbury this week. For yet another week, Shrewsbury was completely devastated and affected by floods. And ironically, you can look around today, I was actually in the town centre yesterday, and you can hardly tell it even happened. That's what always, I can never quite get my head around, that when Shrewsbury floods, it's so horrific and so quick and so sudden, and then it's just gone again. And you're just looking at this nice pretty river and you're like, oh, isn't that nice? And it's a bit murky, admittedly, this time of year, but it is quite in- uh, incredulous to me that it can be utter carnage for as long as it is and cause such devastation, but then it subsides so quickly. I don't exactly know where this picture was taken. It was difficult this week to Google a picture of floods in Shrewsbury 2022. And this came up. It could have been many years. Sadly, this has become a reality for us in Shrewsbury that almost every year we see flooding like this. And you kind of think, well, hold on a minute. Why are we talking about this? And we've just listened about a song called Oceans, which she told us was the formula, you know, the basis for the sermon. Well, because I was getting ready for work. I don't take the park and ride anymore. Now we live in Greenfields. I walk to work. So there's no, when I was on the park and ride bus, God told me stories. That's how most of my sermons start, if you know me well. If you don't, you can listen back and laugh about how many times I say it. Um, but I was getting ready for work and I was thinking, which route are we going to have to take? Because I don't know where I'm going to be able to go to get to work. It's very exciting. Am I going to have to wade through water? Should I go in my wellies? And I was thinking about this as I was getting ready. And I was thinking about, quite rightly so, so hear me clearly here, I'm not advocating going through floodwaters, and I did not go through any floodwaters, can I add? I didn't wade through any. But when flooding happens in Shrewsbury, what's the major things we hear? Don't go near the floodwater. Don't think it's a good idea to start wading through it. Don't start walking through it. Don't try and drive through it. It's really dangerous. Whatever happens, stay away from the water. Right? Did everybody hear that message at least once this week? And if you're on social media, you probably saw that delightful video. Of the, I'm, I'm not throwing lady drivers onto the bus, but it was a woman in a car. Uh, some of you were sniggering, I know you know what I'm talking about. Who I think it was on the road that goes right by from the weir all the way around into, I don't know where that comes Sydney out. Sydney Avenue, thank you, I always forget that road. <laughs> and like, she was just driving, and water was almost up to her like driving window. Like, we're talking like deep water. And she was driving with her window down, which is why we know it was a woman. We could see her very clearly. And then she eventually wound the window up because she realized she was being filmed. And all these people were like, what is she doing? And she just drove almost all the way, I think it was, along Sydney Avenue. I have no idea why. I don't know what happened. But that was reposted, I think, even by the council eventually going, do not do this. This is absolutely ridiculous. Under no circumstances should you do that. She seemed to be completely <coughs> oblivious to the very obvious danger to the rest of us. So I was contemplating this, and I was thinking about all these warnings about don't be in deep water, and then this song, Oceans, popped into my head. And I know it relatively well, so I was, you know, kind of muttering through it in my head. I wasn't listening to it, it wasn't on the radio or anything like that, it wasn't on my playlist, I was just listening, I just came to my head. I was thinking, but that song talks very clearly about the absolute opposite of what we're told to do when it comes to deep water. Now obviously there are other circumstances where there's deep water, where as long as you can swim, we're encouraged to go in it. If it's a pool, or you know, even the ocean, or you can jump off the edge of a boat, you know, you can take trips, you can pay good money to take a trip so you can go snorkelling off the side of a boat, or you can go scuba diving, you know, and and obviously, you know, when you're trained and you can do those things. So there are scenarios where as long as you're a reasonably competent swimmer, you can go in deep water. 
But the song Ocean seems to go against these warnings of deep, dangerous water that's unknown. So let's take a closer look at the lyrics, because there was no lyrics on that song, so if you're not familiar with it, or even if you are, let's take a look through. It says, you call me out upon the waters, the great unknown where feet may fail, and there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours and you are mine. Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't start now. And the bridge says this, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Saviour. So the song makes it really clear that we are called to go into the water. And obviously this is metaphorical. My dad is probably having a bit of a panic attack now because he's not a swimmer. And so the thought of being in any form of deep water is just in no way appealing to him at all. We can barely, I mean, I don't think I can even convince him to go into a jacuzzi. But he's just not a swimmer. He just doesn't like it. doesn't enjoy it at all. <clears throat> but this song is very clear. That metaphorically, we are supposed to be in deep water. I am not suggesting anyone leaves here and goes and jumps in the River Severn. Do not do it. It is not a good idea. At any point in the year, the River Severn can be very dangerous. This is, I'm not just advocating it right now. Okay, do not <coughs> do it. The Reebrook, you can possibly swim if you can find somewhere deep enough in the summer. Don't think about anything else, okay? But in the song, they're not just talking about dipping your toe in, having a little bit of a paddle, and calling it good. No, no, no. Sorry, Dad, I can't get over that. <laughs> Lyrics like, in oceans deep. When you think of the <coughs> ocean, uh, to me, I don't say but a sea isn't quite as deep as an ocean in my head. That's because I'm a blonde, but you know. Uh, uh, oceans are like oceans, and they're terrifying, and they're deep and scary. Is anyone else in that? And seas are like, oh, you can swim in the sea. Isn't that nice? <laughs> then the other lyric is, keep my eyes above the waves, which to me means you kind of almost sink in. You can just about keep your head above water. Grace abounds in deepest waters. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. If you put that in the context of the sea or the ocean, take me deeper than my feet could wander. That's you're going beyond where your feet can touch the bottom, right? We're talking all in, over your head, dark and potentially murky, swimming only deep, deep water. <coughs> but what on earth does this song mean? And why is one of the most famous Christian worship songs of the past decade using the analogy of water in such a way? And if this song is linked to a Bible story, why would God be asking us to go in deep water when, from everything else we understand, deep and dangerous water is not so where we should be going? So I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about, there's a degree to which when we're warned not to go in flood waters. There's a fear that's put on us about that, deliberately. We're made to be fearful of that kind of water, and rightly so. Fear tells us to steer clear of something that's dangerous. We're warned to stay out of deep water, strong currents, all of those things. But the song is using the metaphor of water to challenge us to go deeper in our faith. And faith is the opposite of fear. And to not shy away from the unknown, which goes against everything in us. We are created and we're in a culture that tells us to be fearful of the unknown, to be fearful of the dangerous, to be fearful of the, the scary stuff that's out there. But the song is asking us 
to trust the Holy Spirit to take us deeper and to grow our trust in our relationship and our faith and to let, and allow us to lead lives that are completely led by the Holy Spirit. To allow the Holy Spirit complete access. And when I was thinking about all of this, and there was a lot of muddled thoughts in my head, so I really have been praying that it comes out more coherently than all these random thoughts that have some form of coherence. But <laughs> there was just so much that God was speaking to me about. But what really struck me is one of my greatest desires as a leader is to see all of us, and this is very key, this is not me going, well, I've made it and I want you all to be where I am. This is all of us growing. We're all in different stages. We've been Christians for different lengths of times. We've had different experiences. We've had different childhoods. We've had different church um, places that we've been over the years. We've had different teaching. But one of my greatest desires is to see all of us growing and maturing and going as deep as we possibly can in our relationship with God at all costs. Whatever it looks like. And God has put a hunger, for lack of a better word, in me to see that through for myself first and then for each and every person that he brings into my life and allows me to speak into I don't want to stay in the same state of relationship with God. I want to go deeper. I want him to have access to every area of my life. And again, this isn't me patting myself on the back and going, crashing. I have not got there yet by any stretch of the imagination. But I want him to have access. I want that. And when I'm in the right state of mind, and when I'm in tune with God, I position myself to allow him to do that. And I want exactly the same for each one of you. I want to go deeper, I want him to have access, and as a leader of this church, I will challenge you to move forward. I will challenge you to grow, to not hold back, to risk it all, because I know the life that God has planned for each and every one of us is better than any of us could ever do for ourselves and ever plan or cultivate or structure. I know that wholeheartedly. Does that mean it's going to look pretty all the time? Absolutely not. I wish I could promise you that, but even the Bible doesn't promise us that, so I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you. It is not going to be easy. It is not necessarily pretty. It doesn't mean you're not going to have really, really big challenges. I am stood here right now wrestling with stuff that is so difficult, I feel like it's almost incomprehensible, like it's almost incomprehensible, like insurmountable for me personally. But I really, really want God to deal with it. And I really, really want him to have access so that it's not a problem for me anymore. And there are some areas where I'm like, yeah, I can see we've made progress and we've moved on. And I can see that I am a different person than I was even a year ago about certain things. And there are other stuff and I'm sat in exactly the same position, if not worse, than I was a year ago. Or six months ago. Or last week. Or even an hour ago. One thing I promise you is I won't let you get in your own way. And you might not like that. And I give you full permission, and I've written this, it says, in love, please be nice, I said this to Todd, and I went, in love, and I remember that bit, remember the in love, that doesn't mean you just get to tell me all the crap that I'm doing in my life that I need to sort out, <laughs> but I give you, hands, it's on, it's on film, it's all there, it's going to be on Facebook for the rest of my life, I give you full permission to call me out if I'm getting in my own way, but please, please do it nicely, because I'm, I'm a hot mess and I know it, and there's an awful lot I can do to fix it. So I want us to take a little bit of a look at the scripture that was the foundation for this passage. I mean, in some ways, loads of scripture sews into this song, Oceans, that was written. I'm pointing, I don't know, it's just a blank screen, but the song was there. There's an awful lot of scripture that ties into this. There's a lot that we can unpack about this song. But there's a very specific scripture that they focused on when they were writing this song. And it's from Matthew chapter 14, Verses 22 to 33. 
and John is going to come and read it for us. Uh, Jesus walks on the sea. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went upon the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, Is it a ghost? And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Thank you so much. Wonderful. So again, an awful lot to unpack. And who are we talking about? It's Peter, my favourite biblical character. If you uh, did not hear my sermon on Peter, it is online. You can feel free to go back and watch it. But I love Peter. I think he's fabulous. He's madder than the bucket of frogs, I think, at times. But I kind of love him for that. He's being Peter in this passage in the way only Peter can be. He's bold, gung-ho, all-in, brazen, a little bit foolish, quite brash, passionate. Does he remind you of anyone? <laughs> yeah, I can have those words. I think that's why I love Peter. Not only I can take credit for 99% of Peter's life, but there's some of the brilliant moments where he seems to make a bit of a fool of himself. I'm like, oh, this really helps me feel better about my life. So this is a really well-known passage that we've heard so many times. And Jesus appears to the disciples walking on water across the Sea of Galilee, as we now know it. <clears throat> and they're terrified because they don't know humans that can walk on water. <laughs> so we can go into hours and talk about, hold on a minute, Jesus walked on water to them. Their minds must have been blown. Bear in mind, this comes literally hours it is the night after they have just assisted Jesus in feeding the 5,000. And I'm very key in saying the word insisted. Yes, Jesus did the miracle, but the disciples were the ones distributing it. The disciples collected it, he distributed it. He allowed the disciples to be part of that. They were enacting the miracle. <clears throat> so they are riding on the crest of a miracle wave right now. They have just witnessed one of the most phenomenal things, because it's not just 5,000 people, we know that was 5,000 men. So we could be talking easily 15,000 people. But is it four loaves, two loaves and four fish, or four fish and two loaves, I was going to go all around. So that's just happened, and then Jesus says, get in the boat and cross the sea. And he takes himself up to pray. And then the next minute, four o'clock in the morning, he starts walking across the water towards them, as you do, if you're Jesus. So they're a little bit traumatised because they don't know humans that can do that, so they think it's a ghost. And then when they hear Jesus' voice, they obviously realise who it is. And Peter says, if you command me to come to you, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So Peter's either a little bit nuts, or incredibly passionate. We're going to go with passionate because I don't know many people. If Jesus walked to me on water, I don't think my first response would be, Jesus, if it's you, get me to walk to you too. I think I'd quite sit happy in the boat watching what was happening, thank you very much. I'd be more than happy for Jesus to come and get in your boat, that's fine. But I'm not sure I'd want to get out of the boat and walk to him. But I love that about Peter. Because Peter wants to do it. He wants to do what Jesus does. He wants to be like Jesus. And guess what? We're supposed to be like that too. We're supposed to want those same things. We're supposed to respond in the same sort of way Peter did. With that slightly overzealous, slightly ridiculous faith that says, 
that's my saviour, that is my Jesus, and I can do what he can do. Because he's told me. He's told me over and over again, he's taught me to want to do the things he does. So I see him walking on water, and guess what I want to do? So I took a huge liberty here, and I rewrote Peter's words. Sorry, God, but I did. And this is what I think Peter could have said. Not that I will ever be translating the Bible in any different version. Woohoo! It's Jesus! He's walking on water. He can do anything, and when I'm with him, I can do anything too. Because he's the Messiah. Jesus, teach me to do what you're doing, because I want to be just like you. Now, obviously, the Bible puts it in much more poetic language, even in the message version, than anything I could put together. But he wants to join Jesus on the water. He wants a little bit of everything Jesus can offer him. And that's the kind of faith that this song is talking about. That's the kind of faith that God wants us to have in him. Where we're willing to do anything that God asks of you. Now, when I was writing this, I suddenly had a revelation. I thought, someone's going to be sitting here and thinking, well, I'm not sure God's asked me to do anything. Well, read your Bible. Because I hate to say, you can't get out of it going, well, God hasn't told me to run a church, or God hasn't told me to go and talk to anybody, or God hasn't told me to do blah, 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 whatever it is. It doesn't have to be the audible voice of the Lord. He doesn't have to appear to you and say, you need to do this. He's given us an awful lot of instruction in the Bible about how we should be, how we should be conducting ourselves, how we should be behaving, and what we can be doing. So nobody can sit here and go, but he hasn't told me to do anything, Ruth. There's my out. I told you I'd be mean, but it's because I love you. <laughs> we need to be able to put aside all reason and do what God asks us to do. We need to have faith and willingness like Peter to step at the boat, believing that we are able to do all the things that Jesus did and more. Because he said that. I think it's John 14. You will do greater things than me. That is a powerful thing from Jesus. You will do greater things than me. So let's look back at the text, because then it doesn't all end beautifully. Well, it ends beautifully, but it gets a bit messy in the middle, just like our lives. Peter steps out of the boat, heads towards Jesus. He begins with confidence. His <coughs> eyes are fixed on Jesus. It says very clearly, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So you're assuming he just steps out of the boat. He's not worried about stepping out of the boat. I think I'd be looking at the water at that point. But he's looking at Jesus. He's stepping out that boat and he's keeping his eyes on Jesus. And then it says, um, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. Now different versions say different things. When he saw the wind was strong, some say when he took his eyes off Jesus. He begins with confidence, but it, and he almost forgets the magnitude of what he's doing. He's not thinking, oh, I'm about to walk on water. He's thinking, I'm going to walk to Jesus. Like I've done a thousand times on land. And then the wind blows and he gets distracted and he looks around him and he panics. He wavers, he falters and he begins to sink. I don't even know what that must have felt like for Peter. To be going along dead confidently and then all of a sudden, almost your legs go out from under, it doesn't, but the, the water goes out from under and you start sinking. But what does he do? He calls out to Jesus. Help me, save me, rescue me. Different versions say different things. And Jesus stretches out a hand immediately and grabs him and pulls him back up onto the water. And he says, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So we immediately know that Peter's issue is a faith issue. It's not, a, oh no, that big gust of wind caught you and you lost your footing. Or why are you so stupid to get out of the boat, Peter? You can't walk on water. None of that was said. Oh, you of little faith, 
Why did you doubt? And he says the same to us. Oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And I doubt all the time. Not just daily, hourly, minute by minute at times. Because that cycle of whatever it is that I'm dealing with is going around my head. And sometimes it's rears its ugly head and the doubt sets in. And before I know it, the doubt sets in. It's not like I'm going, okay, doubt, here you come. Open door. No, the doubt's there. And before I know it, I'm doubting God. I'm doubting God's capable. I'm doubting God's willing. I'm doubting God's able. I'm doubting he wants to. For whatever the issue is. You can, I can apply that to thousands of issues. And the lyrics of the song reiterate this verse. Where feet may fail, we will fail. We will fall. We'll get it wrong. We'll mess up. We'll fall. We'll falter. We'll be distracted. We can be going along really good and then something will come and it will distract us. It will take our eyes off Jesus. And that's partly what Todd was talking about this morning. And that's why we decided very strategically to not do anything different in our service because of what's happening in the news, because of what's happening in the world. Because the greatest thing I believe we can teach today is that we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and it doesn't matter what is happening in the world. It doesn't mean that's not important and it doesn't mean God doesn't care and it doesn't mean that those issues aren't incredibly serious. But our eyes need to be fixed on Jesus, not what is happening around us. And you can apply that to every single thing in your life. Be it a personal, internal struggle that only you know about, and maybe even your spouse doesn't know is an internal struggle, or that maybe your best friend hasn't got a clue about. It could be that thing, right the way through to COVID, wars, you know, earthquakes, natural disasters, energy prices rising. There is always something we can be worried about. There is always something to distract us. There is always something that's going to cause us a nightmare. Either metaphorical or real. But our eyes and our focus have to be on Jesus. Because he will carry us. One very key thing in this scripture that I have never really noticed before is that Jesus grabs Peter's hand, saves him, and lifts him onto the water. And then it says, and then they got in the boat. And I've always had it in my head. Peter's walking, he starts to sink, Jesus grabs him and they're in the boat. But then I was like, wait, there's a whole other step. Now, I don't know how long that was. I don't know whether they stood in the water for 20 minutes or whether they stood in the water for 10 seconds and then they got in the boat. That's not clear. That's not important. But I think we often think that what we want and what we pray for is God to remove the challenge, to remove the distraction, to remove the situation. But even here, that's not what God did. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus rescued the person, rescued Peter, and held him in the water, or on the water. I don't know whether one was in, one was on, whether they were both on. And then they got in the boat. And I just thought, that's really interesting, because there's been numerous situations in my life, and there's still one currently, a massive one, where it's still happening. The, the awful thing, the terrible situation, the, the thing I'm wrestling with is still there. It is still active and nothing about that has changed. But what needs to change is our perspective and our attitude and our focus. Because Jesus is holding my hand in that situation and he is right there with me in it. He's not disappeared, he's not distant, he's not uncaring. He's right there, just like he was with Peter. But he doesn't put Peter in the boat right away. 
And that's really tough. Because nobody wants to hear, yeah, your circumstances are really crap, and you know what, they might stay really crap. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that they are going to stay terrible. It doesn't mean it's just going to be like that for the rest of time. Things change, things ebb and flow. Your circumstances will change. COVID was not something that is, it wasn't here two years ago. Two years ago, we barely even knew about it. I know, I was celebrating my birthday and we still laugh about the fact we had a party on the 1st of March with like 40 people there. And 20 days later or whatever, we were going into lockdown. Things will always come, challenges will always come, but it's about our perspective. When we step out, God will meet us. Sometimes it might not appear as such and we may begin to sink into doubt, but if we fix our eyes on Jesus, we will rise. Our action of faith in the midst of uncertainty not only allows God to demonstrate his power and his faithfulness, but it will increase our faith when we begin to see him working. And if he calls you, he will carry you. And he's called all of us. This isn't talking about specific unique callings. It means that as well, but it's not just that. He has called every one of us. It's just like we've been talking about in the last few weeks. That song we sung, God's not worried, so why do I worry? Jesus wasn't worried walking on the water. He just decided he's going to start striding across the Sea of Galilee. As you do. <coughs> he's not even worried when Peter starts to sink. I don't think there was a moment where Jesus said, Oh no! This is all going horribly wrong! <laughs> Peter was able to step out of that boat with all confidence because he knew who he was and what he was capable of with Jesus. It didn't mean he had it fully understood. He clearly didn't because we go on to see an awful lot of errors that Peter continues to make. But there was a degree to which Peter understood who he'd been created to be and what he was capable of when he was with Jesus and when he understood his position, he could do those things. Our trust and our faith get strengthened when we understand who we are in Christ. When we understand how he's gifted us, how he's created us, and how much he loves us. And as our perspective of our relationship with God grows and deepens, so does our trust. We don't need to be afraid of deep water with God. We don't need to worry. We don't need to be afraid. If you find yourself overwhelmed at times with these things or anything similar, then you need to change your perspective. And you're going to go, well, that's easy. But how do I do that? Like, come on. I can't just change your perspective. And I hate to say it, but you can. It takes time, but you can. And the reason you need to change your mindset is because it's wrong and it's not biblical. And I can't mince my words. I'm not telling you off because we all do it all the time. So this is not a finger wagging. But we cannot have wrong biblical mindsets. We have to line ourselves up with what the Bible tells us. And we have to do everything we can to working towards aligning ourselves with what the Bible says. So one of the first tips I'll give you is ask God to help you. Ask God to show you. I am not a biblical scholar. I do not know my Bible inside out by any stretch of the imagination. One of the biggest panics I always have about putting sermons together is where will I ever find that reference? And I'm trying to quote it and get it all the wrong way around. So I ask God. I ask the Holy Spirit to help me. And I'm not walking around all the time going, Holy Spirit, help me do these things. But when I know I'm in a big hot mess, I eventually usually get round in my head to the bit where I go, oh, I should probably ask God to sort this out. Minor detail. 
probably should have, should have thought about that a few hours ago before I had a complete meltdown. We need to pray. And we need to understand the truth of the Bible. I've recently started every year, well not every year, multiple times, because every year I just decide to decide that's a stupid thing to start as a New Year's resolution. It's not really a New Year's resolution. But I'm getting really sick of my inability to try and do the Bible in one year. I've tried it numerous times and I've gone every year going, I am going to start a study and I'm going to keep doing it because it's really important to read my Bible every day. And I falter and I fail and I usually get part way through January and I've missed so many days that I kind of give up and then feel really terrible about myself. And then I get to about April before I think about it again. It's terrible. That's how bad I am at reading the Bible. Complete honesty right now. So I've started doing an audio Bible. I thought, right, how can I do this so I can actually try and do it? I've skipped a lot of days, I'm not going to lie, not deliberately. Anything that throws my routine off is not a good thing for me. But I've been listening to an audio Bible, I think I'm on day 50. I'm like, well, we're only at the end of the second month. I think day 50 of two months isn't, that's not, it's only about 10 days, isn't it? That's all right. Okay, I'm doing okay. Brandon's going to be proud of himself, not patting myself on the back, not giving myself any gold stars. But I found it really helpful. I'm not saying everyone needs to go home tomorrow and start doing an audio Bible. But find a way that you can delve into the scriptures so that they're helpful to you. Don't just pick a method that someone else tells you is good, because it won't work. You have to find something that works for you. And if it means every week you start a new technique until you find something that works, and it takes you multiple years to figure it out, that's fine. But find a way to get the word in your life. Now, I, I don't, you know, hear every single word of every bit of the audio Bible every day I'm doing it. But it's opening it up in a new way to me. And I'm actually really enjoying it. And we're, you know, we're heading into, like, Exodus, Leviticus. Some very interesting rules and regulations and names and stuff, which is all a bit confusing. But it's making a lot more sense to me than it ever has before when you go through something chronologically. So you need to understand the truth of the Bible and find a way to help yourself do that. And then you need to step away from unhealthy and unhelpful cultural mindsets that say you're not worthy and you're not valuable and you're not important. Because I hate to tell you this, but I've witnessed it firsthand in my own life and because I've now lived in another culture. But there is something very British that tells us that we're not good enough and we're not worthy. And I don't fully, we've, Todd and I have talked about this for months on and off. I don't fully know what it is, but it is different in other cultures. Years. Yes, we are. We're cumulative months, I was thinking, not like we've only been talking about it for months. Yeah, we've known each other for 11 years, I think we've been talking about it on and off all the way through. There's something that we get changed around as British people, and I discovered it by being immersed in an American culture where it made me very uncomfortable at times. And I think I preached about this before, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating it, but it's, it's a very important point. It was, I was in a room of people, I was on the internship, which was a Christian year long, two year long discipleship program, and I was in a room of about 45 young Christians. And we were in a prayer time, we'd been doing some worship, and then we'd gone into prayer. And the leader said from the front, I want you to spend some time now, I want you to ask God for anything. Just ask God for whatever it is you want or need. And I immediately felt uncomfortable, because my thought was, who am I to ask God? I don't have the right to ask God for anything. Who am I? Now, I now know that is a complete lie. So if you are in that place, congratulations. You haven't made it, there's still plenty more to go. But you've, made, you've overcome a huge hurdle. But you are the most important thing to God. And you go, but hold on a minute, there's a lot of us. Yeah, there's an awful lot more than what's sat in this room. But he would have done it for one of you. He would have done everything he did in the Bible. Jesus would have died on the cross for every single individual. That sheep story that Todd gave where the guy rescues the sheep, 
I haven't seen it where the sheep then jumps back into the same void. I've seen one where the ba- they, they use it as an example of what Jesus did. He went after the one sheep. There was one sheep trapped, and he went after the one sheep. But you, we've heard that story. We all know the story. And we all go, yes, but Jesus went after the one, and Jesus would do it just for you. But do you know and understand what that means in your head and in your heart? Because if you do, I promise you that changes your perspective. Because you know that God would do it for you. And you know that he loves you more than he loves anything else. And because God is God, he can love all of us more than he can love anything else all at the same time. Because he's not human. So he's not confined to human abilities. So in this song... My soul will rest, so it says, when oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours and you are mine. That is what this scripture is talking about. This song, but it is also scripture. Regularly through scripture we're told that we are God and God is up. Yeah, we are God and he is ours. It's really hard to say the other way around. (laughs) But we have to allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what that means. And we have to allow it to sink in. And you have to sit there, and it's uncomfortable. Because British people don't like being told that they're important and valuable. (laughs) See? Some of you are looking very uncomfortable because you know it's true, right? Or am I completely off piece right now? So please tell me if I am. It is a very uncomfortable, unnatural feeling to feel important. And that's false humility. It is false humility. Now, it doesn't mean you have to walk around going, oh, I'm amazing, look at me, I'm fabulous. But God walks around going, they're amazing, look at them, they're fabulous. You're amazing, look at you, you're fabulous, you're my creation. I love you, and I sent my son to die for you. Because I want the best life for you that you could ever have, better than you could ever imagine. And that is the life and the Christian relationship I want every one of us to have. I want it for myself, I want it for Todd, and I want it for every single one of you here, and multiple other people that aren't here. And it's scary, and it's terrifying, and it means that the waters can come all around us and we can go to hell and back. But we will come back. Because Jesus is with us every single step of the way, holding our hand and walking us through it. And I've talked for way too long, I'm sure. I think that's all I have to say, maybe. But we're going to do some response chats now, where because there's an awful lot to think about in process. None of this is particularly easy. But um, I want us to listen to the song again, and hopefully with a bit of a different perspective. Um, and then um, to just really give us a chance to process through this and talk to the Lord and move on.